students. Welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science and Module 5, Earth's Processes. This is video number four and we're going to start looking at the first photosynthetic life. So we want you to be able to understand some of the evidence for the development of photosynthetic life and specifically how this links to cyanobacteria and stromatolites. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that we know what a stromatolite is to be able to link stromatolites and cyanobacteria and then to evaluate some of the evidence that we have uh, for the first photosynthetic life from the stromatolites that are found in the fossil record. So up to this point, we've been discussing some of the ideas behind how life began on Earth, specifically the formation of organic molecules. We know that there was a lot of inorganic materials around, but we also know that we are an organic species and life on Earth is linked by these very important groups of carbon-based compounds, uh, carbohydrates, proteins, uh, lipids or fats and nucleic acids and these uh, all had to be constructed and produced um, and they had to start somewhere and so we talked about life beginning in the oceans perhaps at these hydrothermal vents at these these deep sea uh, mid-ocean ridges where there was a lot of material coming up from the mantle and creating new crust at the same time we had some percolation happening with some of the salty water becoming even higher in salt content, very briny. And the consequence of that was that as it went through, um, it dissolved the materials, then returned to the oceans. Uh, it did so in such a way that you had very hot water um, or solutions mixing with very cold seawater and we get precipitation happening we got these black or white smokers and we got quite a community of organisms that built around that really in uh, a community that was based on chemosynthesis and it had to be chemosynthesis because there just wasn't any light there was no opportunity for light to penetrate to those depths so it couldn't have been a process that relied on light it had to be a process that relied on some sort of chemical reactions. Of course, it could have arrived here um, from somewhere else out in space, the idea that life is everywhere, and perhaps it was seeded here on Earth um, through a meteorite which is, has come from somewhere else in the universe, arrived on Earth, and um, led to all of the species that we now see on our planet. Well, whichever of these, um, the last couple of videos and the investigations have um, helped to convince you, what we do know is that um, this was not in any of these situations something that was um, a link to photosynthetic life. For photosynthetic life, we had to think about the process of photosynthesis. What does that involve? When did it first happen? What are the simplest organisms that we're aware of that are capable of doing that? Very nicely off the western coast of Australia um, is an area known as Shark Bay. And Shark Bay is full of these magnificent structures called stromatolites, and they're still there today. They're very shallow, so you can see the waters are very shallow. It's also very salty, and they can only grow in areas where they're protected from predators, especially grazing things like gastropods, snails, and, and their kin. Uh, so they're not found very many places today on Earth, but they are found, these solid um, stromatolite structures are found in the fossil record. And we can see from looking at how they are uh, formed today, the cross section, um, and how they continue to grow, what may have been the parallel in the past, okay? And so we, we use organisms from the present to help us to build clues about what might have been happening in the past when we extract information from the rocks in, in the form of fossils. The first evidence of these sorts of structures are over three billion years ago. So very, very old rocks contain these stromatolites or evidence of um, stromatolite formation, which means that this type of life, and we now know that stromatolites are linked to a particular type of bacteria called cyanobacteria, and that they're the ones that are forming these stromatolites today off the coast uh, in Shark Bay, off the coast of WA, and they must have been a similar sort of organism that was building these billions of years ago.
The other clue that we have are banded iron formations, and banded iron formations are things that we'll talk about in a separate video later on, and they're of a kind of a similar sort of age. But the interesting thing about iron is that these banded iron formations were a result of increasing levels of oxygen interacting with iron in the oceans and precipitating out the iron oxides. Now this happens until you reach a certain point where there's no iron left and then you get increases in oxygen in the uh, atmosphere, you get some significant changes that are occurring that allows for a lot of other types of organisms to be able to use that um, now available uh, oxygen uh, as a gas. So there's some clues here about the increase in the amount of photosynthesis that was happening and they center on these uh, particular types of organisms called cyanobacteria. So when we look, we've kind of moved away from the idea of um, uh, kingdoms into this area of domain. So kind of a level above the kingdom level. We, we used to talk about animal kingdoms, plant kingdoms, um, protists and um, prokaryotic organisms. Now we're talking very much about domains, these kind of two areas where there are eukaryotic cells, and that's pretty much everything that we can think of, with the exception of, of certain groups of bacteria. Now the bacterial groups are also split into two quite distinct lifestyle um, preference um, forms. And so that's the distinction between the archaea or the archaebacteria and um, the, the bacteria. So these are the ones that we think are probably associated with our uh, deep sea vents, our black smokers, places that they've given names like extremophiles, thermophiles, um, halophiles. This, this is lovers of salts, lovers of heat. Um, extremes, lovers of extreme conditions that can include pressure. Some of these organisms have been found in the depths of the crust. Um, some of them are, use methane as their um, source for fuel, for respiration, or, or whatever that, that uh, process is that, that's kind of the parallel of respiration. And so we find these are very unusual organisms, very different from any other types, and very specific in the types of conditions that they can live in, and in fact, uh, capable of living in conditions that, that no other organisms that we're aware of can, can survive. And of course, that means they are also the candidates for potentially moving through um, a universe that is very cold, um, and it has no atmosphere um, and potentially for long periods of time before they find themselves on a, on a planet or a place that is um, friendly, that is able to support um, life. The other important thing about the uh, archaebacteria is that they are chemosynthetic, not um, photosynthetic, and they prefer environments that are uh, zero or very low oxygen. So this is important for us in terms of thinking about an early atmosphere that was uh, that, that lacked oxygen. But then we know that um, as some of these chemicals were starting to be introduced, maybe this was um, a, a an environment that was developing around one of these uh, black smokers. But at some point, there was a migration of life. Something happened that brought these particular types of organisms into some sort of um, interaction with the light. And of course, sunlight, high in energy, great source of um, uh, the energy that's required for chemical reactions, for what we call endothermic reactions, ones which require an input of energy. And photosynthesis is one of those. So when we were looking at some of the key um, possible candidates for this, again, we looked at the bacteria. We know that there's a number of different bacteria. We've probably heard of nitrogen-fixing bacteria, so bacteria that work on nitrifying or denitrifying the soils, some that, some that can use sulfur or hydrogen as their fuel sources, some that even can um, process some of those iron compounds that were building up uh, in the early, um, uh, that were part of that early earth. We know that um, a lot of the meteorites that came to the earth um, were rich in iron. So we know that iron was also something that was available. But none of those even though a lot of them may have used carbon dioxide, they weren't good candidates either. They were also ones that preferred this sort of um, low to zero oxygen environments. So 
again, they were practicing some sort of chemosynthesis rather than photosynthesis. So the group that we had to focus on was the cyanobacteria. Now, you may find reference in old books um, to blue-green algae. Don't use that term. Um, algae are eukaryotic, and the cyanobacteria or blue-green algae are not. So, therefore, it's, it's a bit of a misnomer to be using a term that associates them with algae. So we'll leave that out. We won't use the blue-green algae um, label. We'll use cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are the ones that are associated with the stromatolites. They are the ones that we believe were maybe these first photosynthesizers, the first organisms that were actually capable of using light as an energy source for chemical reactions. And so this is the link between the stromatolites and the cyanobacteria. It's the cyanobacteria that actually build the stromatolites. They're doing it now, they were doing it before. What the stromatolites are, are just dense mats that basically cover these shallow sea floors. But what we found is that the bacteria had little extensions in their cells, um, ten like tendrils, that were able to trap sediment and um, hold it in place and so they sort of built these little columns and you can see in the diagram here I've got a little bit of a cross section which shows some of the active layers that that pigment that we associate with photosynthesis um, a crystalline layer which is basically those sediments that have been incorporated into the structure and you can see that there's layers layer upon layer upon layer that are building as we look at these structures, uh, building these fantastic stromatolite structures. Now they've been found in incredibly old ancient rocks. And so we feel like that there's a potential that these organisms have been around on the earth for a very, very long time. And therefore photosynthesis is a very old and ancient process one which was taking carbon dioxide and water and turning it into carbohydrates, specifically glucose in this case, and oxygen gas. And that oxygen which was building up in the oceans was starting to precipitate some of the iron and also was uh, going to start to change the nature of the atmosphere. And so this is a significant step forward. This process, photosynthesis, we now know, in fact, before we discovered the, the deep sea vents, we thought it was the basis of all food chains on Earth. Now, we know that's not the case, but it still dominates um, the majority of the food chains on Earth. They all start with autotrophs. They all start with organisms that are capable of photosynthesizing. So this was a critical development in the, in, um, the first early life and it's what led to a great diversity. But we'll have a look at the diversity of life in subsequent videos. Thanks for watching.